in the middle. Here we go. <laughs> Seconds for people that don't watch us on our screen. It mightn't happen on fa Facebook, Ren, but you know the way we can see the people dropping in on the right-hand side? Yeah. Uh, I'm always a little bit anxious at the first 20 seconds, and I'm oh, there we go. Tor Hoops and Janet Nixon. There good you stuff. go. Janet Nixon's oh, always great first to see you, oh, Janet. Yes. Lovely. Good stuff. Thanks for joining us. Rach, guys. Is always, Rach is always very quick on the mark. She She's is. third today. She's a bronze Absolutely. medal for her, oh, but a medal nonetheless. She, she, loves a, she loves a freebie, Rachel Mack. She just loves a freebie. So yeah. she loves these shows. <laughs> <laughs> She'd be delighted with that. <laughs> You and are Bianca, in so much trouble. If, uh, if the gold, silver, or bronze medalist uh, fail on the dope test, you are getting a medal. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no questions asked. Hang in there. in there, Bianca yeah. Christensen. Yeah, you are all good. You are oh, all guys, in good shape. we are we are Pet Medics. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, you are going to find us over on Patreon.com forward slash Raw Pet Medics. Every little bit helps. And if you can afford the price of a cup of tea or coffee that keeps us going here, we deeply appreciate it. And if you can't, not to worry at all. Tonight, we're going to be talking about Addison's and Cushing's and other such adrenal issues and whatnot, I'm sure. And it was a learning curve for me as I tried to prepare for today. And I now I realize this is very much a veterinary matter. So I know I'm going to be sitting at the back of the bus <laughs> for this one and listening patiently. I've lined up my questions, though. You'd be glad to hear. But aside all that, before we get to that, Anything exciting happening this week that anybody wants to regale us with a tale? Oh, you've got to you've got to talk about the um, next bit in the vegetarian. Oh yeah, oh, saga. Good. Go on, mm. come on, well, Nick. You were you were all over I, it over the weekend. The vegetarian saga. There's another what study. Way? Another study came out for the. Oh yeah, Johnny was was uh, our silver surfer. Greetings, Johnny, if you're there. Um, he has been uh, feeding us some information, as it were, not not uh, vegan uh, food, uh, I'm pleased to say. And um, I can't remember because, like, guys, I've been visiting my old 85-year-old auntie in Monaco uh, over the weekend. So it, that sounds nice. like a real trip in, you know, in, in, in paradise. But it was a 12-hour journey there and back okay and i was only there for about 36 hours so although That's it was lovely in monaco and i did paddle my toes in the med on saturday morning Ooh, after nice. a very very pleasant coffee that was about it did you lovely. know monaco it just gives you some just something it's three miles long one mile deep and it's got the highest density of people in the world Tokyo Ooh. has a population density of about 7,000 7, people per square kilometer. Monaco has a population density of 18,000. So it is the de most densely populated chunk of land in the world. Wow. Most nowhere... of them living underground. What's going on? Well, yeah. I'll, well, there's a lot of underground stuff going on, but there's nowhere to walk a dog. So it's not my the best place for me, me thinks. It's worth seeing and it's very historical and everything else. Yeah. But you can't walk a dog. So um Somebody's... not my cup of tea. Somebody said that about a place I asked them how they get on and some holiday they, the holiday they went on. And they said, uh, worth seeing, not worth going to see. Because they didn't like the journey and the, and the whole hassle of getting there. And the the traffic. One of those places you check out on YouTube. Um, that, that sounds nice. We actually saw Monaco. I didn't go down into it, but we, we had a beautiful holiday. The south of France, we flew into wherever you're flying to in the south of France. Nice. And we, yeah, Nice, yeah. And we got this uh, train. There's loads of little old trains along the south of France. Boom, 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 boom. You do all the towns, starting from the very poshest there on the left. And you do and you do uh, uh, Nantes and Saint Nice. Saint-Tropez and, and all Saint those. Yeah. and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, and Saint-Julien and... and uh, and then you go past Monaco and you can go cross into Italy to the bottom of the Alps. I think I told you about this before. And the trains are really cheap and old and you pull the glass down. But we just went past Monaco, but it doesn't look like high riseville It looks like beautifully well built, although, you know, nestled in there. I wouldn't have thought there was that many people in it. Wow, I am surprised. Yeah, it's absolutely packed. I mean, beautiful and everything else. And, you know, lots of Gucci and lots of Prada and all that stuff. <laughs> whatever yeah. that is yeah you know um but but yeah all good really all good all good all good um what, what was i going to say yeah so that's what i was doing so i was absolutely knackered for the first couple of uh, days um but i'm feeling like a human being now so that's all good so as far so as far as that was my excuse for not for not remembering 
What happened on the vegan? I had a quick look at vegan it. I mean, food for dogs. Brand, did what did was, you have a look that? at it, Brand? It's a, another study has come out to show that uh, vegan pet food, that, that plant based pet food, and look, guys, when we're slagging off vegan, we're not slagging off human vegans, which is far more appropriate for our species, uh, which is you know more more likely for our species, I should say. Um, we're, we're talking about pet food here, particularly the, the plant-based pet food. But another study has come out. I can't remember the authors, but this time it wasn't uh, it wasn't night. But um, uh, and it, it it kind of was a similar study to one that was done many years ago by night, where they followed these dogs for for a year. Well, they didn't follow them for a year. They tested them at the end of the year, and they tested a number of parameters. I mean. It was impressive. They tested a number of farmers, like from blood and and um, bloods and and three or four. I had messaged you there recently what they were. It was it was an improvement on the study they did previously. But the issue is with it is that what they compare these dogs to are dogs fed meat based dry foods. They make a point of saying meat based all the time in these studies, meat based dry foods, and it's like. Well, you know, you are comparing that to cereal based pet food. It's not meat based if one of the ingredients is 4% and the other ingredient is 60%. You know, that's not meat based. That's like corn based or wheat based. And so, uh, and when we say 4% meat in some of these dry foods with chicken, with beef, many of the veterinary brands are with chicken, with beef. That means 4% beef bone meal, which, you know, hardly any meat at all. So, what you're actually doing is you're comparing your food to other virtually vegan plant-based foods and so i find that something of an unfalsifiable comparison it's like okay your dogs can blow within these accepted norms for cereal based uh, cereal fed dogs don't forget your raw fed dogs are being compared to dry fed dogs as if this is the normal iron level for a normal fed dog it's like well it's not for a raw fed dog because they eat more natural iron and they eat more protein so the protein levels are higher perhaps these little norms need to change but uh, so this study did show that they that these dogs uh, could could blow uh, within the accepted norms for these uh, for these bloods. And that's what that study found. So it's not that the study was nonsense. And if anything, as Bren rightly pointed out, it's not like raw dog food companies are doing longevity studies or putting dogs through two, three, four years. We would say in that defense yeah, but we're not the ones jumping to some really strange, idiotic food. You know, if you're going to do that, you have to prove that it's safe for dogs. And your dogs will blow the same blood readings as dogs on other plant-based foods. That's what that study shows. It didn't follow. It didn't compare to 100 raw-fed dogs and check, you know, um, the strength and condition in these dogs or any sort of things, or even the longevity or what's the incidence of disease will be in these dogs in four, five, ten years. None of that. Didn't check the biome. Didn't check any of that. But, you know, if you needed to rest your head, you'd say it's they're probably not. They're no more harmful than the cereal-based pet foods sold in the vets. Did you get a chance to look at it, Brent? Um, or what? I haven't looked at that study. I, I was actually loving your article um, on the phytoestrogens and soy in Ooh, yeah. uh, the vegetarian Ooh. diets and where they're going with that, because I bet they didn't test that in those yeah, studies. Indeed. Uh, so the effects of, of that were going on. And that sort of leads us into tonight, because they're all getting impatient. I can see them on the They right are getting side. impatient. They want, yeah. they want to know, how does that involve Addison's and Cushing's? Well, let me tell you, hormones, <laughs> okay? It's all hormones. So we have the, you know, phytoestrogens having an effect on um, the, the body's constitution. I'm going to call it just for a matter of a, a word. Um, and, and its effects on metabolism and, and fats and fat deposition, all of those things. Well, there's some other hormones that are affected. And many people just assume that this is a hormonal imbalance. But I really would like to bring to people's attention Addison's, which can be life threatening, OK, uh, in the acute form as well, um, and Cushing's, which is a longer form. And this is really and this is where we're going to round it up um, to Addison's being an autoimmune disease. OK, so we can talk about nutrition and how to reduce autoimmune diseases, OK, because it's an attack on the adrenal glands and Cushing's, which is a tumor, usually of one area or the other. So the pituitary gland, OK, um, or the adrenal glands. So pretty much I'm going to just show you a quick diagram there. OK, hand drawn. Uh, cool. Pituitary gland up in the brain. Adrenal glands sit just in front of the kidneys. OK, down. Ad the yeah, adrenal means just on top of the right. renals, which ah, is the kidneys. Yeah. That's where ah. adrenal comes from, which is Oh, quite yes. Cool. Yes. That's, yes. Yeah, thanks. That's very interesting. There you go. So, so that's where you find um, them, just by the kidneys. 
So what Sorry, is guys, carry on? So what is give give us one of them, Brent? What is uh? What, let's start with. Like let's Addison's, start with Addison. Oh, oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, let's do alphabetically. <laughs> Diseases by alphabet. Uh, what is what is Addison's? Give me the uh, elevator pitch for Addison's. What what are we talking? Okay, so Addison's is often seen as a waxing and waning disease, as many autoimmune diseases are, um, and that means it can be quite difficult to diagnose. But it is quite critical in the sense that the normal signs are gastric upset. So usually vomiting and diarrhea and collapse. OK, hang and on, hang on, that, Brent. What is it? What actually is? So it is like? a an inadequacy of your steroid production from your adrenal glands. OK, and that's there the thing. So the adrenal glands produce natural body steroids, both corticosteroids and also the mineralocorticosteroids, which are the ones which will um, maintain your normal electrolyte balance. OK, and that's the critical bit, because we often see in Addison's the vomiting and the diarrhea, but also the collapse are very often related to an excess of potassium, a reduction in the uh, sodium, and Imagine. therefore you will get a reduction in heart. So this heart will slow dramatically. OK, uh, you'll get some irregularities in uh, the normal electrical activity of the heart. And that can be really critical, but you'll get a lot of dehydration um, and Obviously, that can lead, if undetected, to really severe cases. One of the old tests I used to work with a guy who used to say, "Look, if it's coming collapsed, um, you know, and you're you're hearing a really slow heart rate, just give it a shot of Dex. It's not going to do any harm. Just see whether it gets it right." And usually, within 20 minutes, they are up on their feet. What's Dex? Um, if they're Addison's, so that's What's Dex and Methazone. Okay, so that's yeah, because I heard cortisone, treat them with cortisone. So what you're saying yeah. is treat them with the thing you think may be missing. And if they if they respond really well, it's kind of like, do you think this is EPI? Well, pop digestive enzymes in the food. And if your dog does significantly better after the digestive enzymes, as I just had last week, I mean, it's like 24 hours later, this dog's doing a better poo, 48 hours later, oh my God. It's Of course it was EPI. So so that's interesting. So you add in the thing that was missing. Um, and so your vet obviously would do that. We don't want people, well, where else are you going to get yeah. them? No, please don't. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. so, now that's, that's fine in the acute. You know, but usually you're going to look at electrolytes, okay, to, to look at that ratio between sodium and potassium. If it drops below 27, um, you know, 27 parts uh, sodium to one part potassium, then you know that actually that's pretty likely to be Addison's. You can get atypical Addison's where they actually don't get that electrolyte change, but they still have okay. all of the other symptoms. But okay. that's um, what we call atypical. They still will respond to corticosteroids. Okay, that sounds good. Nick, what about the, what about the other fellow? If Addison's on one side of the fence, what's okay. Cushing's? Cushing's. Okay, so I'm just going to give you the, the Peter and Jane. I like the Peter and Jane approach to these things because if you get, like I say to everybody, if you can't read Peter and Jane, you can't read Tolstoy. OK, so let's go with Peter and Jane. So your adrenal glands are all about producing uh, hormones. They produce two types of hormones. One is a called cortisol, which we know as cortisone. OK, the other one, which is to do with uh, uh, maintaining sugar and it runs along with adrenaline. If you get a really terrible shock, then you will get a peak of adrenaline, which allows you to run away from the saber-toothed tiger. But then you'll get a, a peak of cortisol, which will then gradually disappear. But the cortisol is there to help you with any injuries and with um, you know, reducing any inflammation from the battle or the saber-toothed tiger or whatever it might be. OK, so very, very clever stuff. That's what the cortisone is all about. Your mineralocorticoids, on the other hand, from the... the uh, the adrenals as well they are much more subtle and they are as bren was saying they're to do with balancing your sodium and potassium your mineral um your mineral balance okay so cortisone is to do with your um um sugar and inflama inflammatory response and what have you but within the same gland mother nature is very very it likes to do things you know, as, as, as simply as possible you've got the mineral and so that's what they do and so if things go wrong with the adrenals it's usually either the cortisone uh it there's 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 either too little or too much 
cortisone and what we find is that if there's too little cortisone this is addison's you'll often see the problem with not enough mineral corticoids and so you have to help with that side you can't just give steroid you uh, sometimes have to help with the balance of the mineral corticoids i'm not sure if that helped or hindered the, with the description of where we are hopefully that's it basically if you want to say so cushing's disease is too much cortisone and Addison's is the opposite, too little cortisone. That's a really good place to start with thinking about this stuff. Okay. Addison's, too I'll little. Keep that one in my head. Cushing's, so, too much. Yeah. So three types of Cushing's. Okay. You've got one, which is because the pituitary hormones are going wrong. Okay. Which is pituitary is here, right here in your brain, right in the middle. Two there. is that you've got a lump on your adrenal gland. So Jeez. it's producing corticosteroids because of the lump on the adrenal gland. Yeah. And it's the last one is if your uh, dog has been given corticosteroids yeah. and it's constantly being given them at too high a rate because that's the only way to suppress their skin problem, uh, yeah. for example, or they're on immune um, modulation you know to try and suppress an autoimmune disease mm. um, and they're on high levels of corticosteroid and we call that iatrogenic so that is effectively uh, we have caused it to happen to your dog okay, okay. so can, can we come back to the skin conditions let's say a vet is using um um, um non-steroidal anti-inflammatories would that have the same effect uh could the clue in the name of our non-steroidal so would they have the it same wouldn't. effect it wouldn't. non steroids tend to affect the gut, give you uh, ulcers. If they're going to cause a, a problem at all, they tend to be quite safe these days. And that's even kind of Mr. Holistic saying that. But if they're going to have effects, it'll be perhaps liver and kidney. They'll change your liver and kidney parameters. Okay. But what they, what, what, and I find Metacam, I see a lot of dogs who can't tolerate Metacam. As soon as they have Metacam, they get vomiting, diarrhea, and really quite, quite dramatic results. So with non steroids, we get other, we get kind of, reaction to the toxicity or or, or or the problems with the with the drug itself <coughs> with with steroids though steroids are fantastic things if you give them at low level they will just abolish many 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 itchy diseases they won't cure it because as soon as you remove the steroid you're back to square one and you're you're itching as before and there are side effects with with with, with fatty liver putting on weight losing hair and what have you but if you give too much steroid for too long you will get this uh, iatrogenic iatros from uh, greek for doctor it's basically a doctor induced disease yeah. anybody here anybody really if they just give too much steroid to their dog they will just create cushing's disease that's another good way to remember it is you, if you just get if you give too many of these pills for too long you will produce Cushing's disease. And with Cushing's disease, you'll see a you'll see a, a pot belly, you'll see perhaps um uh you'll see uh, uh, alopecia um, balding. Yeah. yeah it's kind of symmetrical it says the man with the hairy back obviously the man with the hairy back yeah yeah <laughs> So you'll get symmetric alopecia, you'll get an increased thirst, you'll get an increased appetite, and uh, you can get this thing, calcinosis cutis, where it, it looks like somebody's slipped areas of, 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 of rocky, gritty material under the skin, which is quite bizarre. Wow, weird. And, and so that, so if... It, it's a relatively easy diagnosis in many, many ways. You take your dog to the vet, they'll do uh, blood tests for Cushing's, they, which is too much steroid. They will do, they will do tests for Addison's, which is too little, different tests, but there are some related. Yeah. Um, and, and then you're into... It's quite confusing the, though, isn't it, at that point? Because mm. there's, there's um, probably four to five tests out there for Cushing's at the moment. Um, and so the the blood tests that we were all brought up in uni on for me was ACTH, which is the um, stimulating hormone from the pituitary that we stimulate the response and look at baseline cortisol where it's stimulated to. Yeah. Um, and that's the sort of overriding one that will determine if they're Addisonian or if they're Cushingoid or you know one of those things. But it's it's not that specific for whether it's the adrenal or the pituitary gland. And so there are then low dose dexamethasone tests and high dose dexamethasone tests, again, which will differentiate further 
um, for Cushing. So, so low dose is much more accurate at working out whether it's Cushing's or, or not. And the high dose is really differentiating the adrenal versus the pituitary uh, source of that Cushing's. Okay. okay. The, uh, the, just before we go past this, uh, give, can we have the top five uh, symptoms of Addison's versus the top five symptoms of Cushing's? I think we've gone through Cushing's there. Nick's kind of gone through that. What are the top five uh, things people should be looking out for um, with Addison's? So top five things, slow heart rate, collapse, vomiting, diarrhea, um, pale mucous membranes. Ah, okay. However, vomiting and diarrhea, can, there's They're a thousand that, things that will cause, is, cause yeah. vomiting Which and diarrhea. You need to but yeah. Yeah. yeah, so with, 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 with the uh, collapsing dog, because you need steroid to cope with stress, yeah, like saber-toothed tigers, if you haven't got enough steroid and you go into a stressful event, that's why you collapse. However, so if every time you, I don't know, you go to town, your dog collapses, then you might think, oh, that's strange. Dog gets a bit stressed and suddenly it collapses. Now, your vet is immediately going to think of heart disease and all sorts of things. But Addison's is way up there in it, it, because if your dog is collapsing because of stress, if your dog gets stressed because the dog next door barks, your dog gets a bit stressed you can you you then collapse it's very difficult because your dog seems to be collapsing all the time and you may not have put two and two together so yeah. collapsing dog there is a list that your vet will go through in their head which will involve um uh, heart disease a lot of neurological disease epilepsy and also addison's for which they can do a blood test and and, and that will help them with that diagnosis so done- just just be aware that many of the so all the symptoms that bren has said are really common to just normal life. Yeah, having pale mucous membranes. Yeah, you may be a bit shocky. You may, there may be lots of different reasons. But if you have some of these together and you take a blood and you go, oh, look, the, the sodium-potassium ratio is way out of whack, then you're on the way to diagnosing uh, yeah. Addison's it sounds uh, it sounds tricky because a lot of the symptoms are so similar. It's really when you get yes. into the blood work. There's a vet here who's all about um, Addison's, and um, she was saying, look, essentially, if her symptoms are worse after a stressful period, that's the biggest red flag, uh, and so that might be helpful for people, as you just said there already. Um, so, she, and also she said, look, a little bit of cortisone if that really helps the dog, uh, it's a really important clue and it points you the right way. And then she said in the bloods, as you've already mentioned again, uh, reduced red blood cells, which is what you were talking about with the anemia in the in the gums there, guys, was it? Yeah. Uh, increases in two kinds of white blood cells. This is all veterinary stuff. It's less for us non-vets to be thinking about, but just in case people listen, in the yosem fields and lymphocytes sites would be increased. Um, and then uh, other things would be out of whack, potassium, uh, uh, sodium going down and that kind of stuff. So there is checks. So if, if you're not quite sure what it is, and you can't quite get that good issue right, because you can imagine... If you've got an excess production of cortisone, so now I'm thinking of Cushing's, isn't it? Is Cushing's is the excess, isn't it? Excess. And yeah, yeah, so if you've got excess of cortisol coming going through your body, can you imagine what effect that's going to have in your gut? Because when people, you get a good shock, you know, you clutch your gut, you don't you? Everyone wants to jump into fight or flight stance when they somebody gives them a scare, but you don't, you clutch your gut. That's the effect of all that stuff, adrenaline and cortisol squishing your guts, no time for digesting. So is that why the poos are bad? Is because it just plays havoc with the guts to have that stuff coursing through you without control? Is that is that the gut so, impact? So it's generally the cortisol. So for me, it's the the imbalance with your normal insulin levels. Your fat deposition will go up. Your so actually for the Cushing's disease and the excess of cortisol, I think there's so many other little things. So they might become diabetic. Sometimes some people will see that excess thirst as the first thing. And there's a bit of a liver driver there, but there's also uh, issues with um, they can become diabetic because it effectively makes them insulin resistant. Um, and therefore they're de- the fat deposition is massively up, so they get a pot belly, um, their thirst goes through the roof, uh, they may have glucose in the urine, and that people will think they're diabetic, but actually there's other diseases that can be causing that. So Cushing's becomes one of the differentials there. I didn't mention actually the fourth test, which is actually now readily available, uh, which is the urine cortisol creatinine ratio. 
And so literally, if you do a urine test, if you don't want to do bloods and you sort of just want to submit urine first, Ooh. then you can uh, send, get them to send that away. And if the ratio of cortisol to creatinine is above 34, pretty much that's a red flag that they need testing for cushions. Cool, cool. That's good. Yeah, because a lot of people get a bit sick of kind of prodding and poking their dog. And so a urine test is a good way to go about it. Michelle makes a good post or makes a good comment here on the side because uh, remember Addison's dogs can react to good stress too. Distress mm -hmm. is negative stress. You stress is positive stress, but it just animates you and gets you to work in the morning and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So these dogs can re react to good stress too. That's a great tip. Like they see when they mm -hmm. see people, they really uh, get excited about their symptoms can pop mm -hmm. up. That's a great tip, Michelle. Nice one for that. Um, okay, so guys, what can we do about it? We have a dog with, where do we start with Addison's? What do you, where do we start? Who wants to do Addison's? Who wants to do Cushing's? I'll do Cushing's. Okay. Okay. So um, from Addison's, um, I think a lot of people get really concerned here because they say, oh, you're going to be talking about withdrawing the uh, steroids that they've been put on for their Addison's. And that's really terrible. You can't do that because that's life threatening. What I would say is, look, first and foremost, I'm not advocating that you just whip away without veterinary attention any current treatment. There are some great um, innovative uh, mineralocorticoid injections now which are four you know every four weeks you can give zycortol um, which is one of those uh, drugs i think if it is under a different name in the states but there is um, zycortol every four weeks you can be trained just like with giving insulin for diabetes an injection um, to give every four weeks and and that pretty much will stabilize the addisonian patient oh, um, it's not like the bad old days where we used to give corticosteroids is the only way to maintain them. Um, and actually that is now reserved really only for atypical Addisonians where they're not showing the electrolyte imbalances uh, that are going on. So do, do talk to your vet. That's the standard conventional. Um, I have gone on from there because once you realize that this is an autoimmune disease, you have to start unraveling all of the things that you would look at for autoimmune disease. Um, and therefore, yeah, where your gut is maybe heightening inflammation because of poor diet, you've got to think, you know, one of the things to do, we would advocate raw to reduce that inflammatory process going on in the gut. We would advocate good microbiome to reduce that inflammation in the gut. We would reduce insulin dependence because that will advocate uh, increase inflammation within the body so we want to reduce inflammatory processes to that there are people talking about glandular uh, support so you can actually feed uh, some adrenal tissue uh, you can uh, actually give homeopathic glandular support um, which I've done with um, or if you can't get that that particular glandular you can actually get ACTH and cortisol and I've used that um, and actually, once you get them over the autoimmune inflammatory process and actually um, start to control that holistically, some of these dogs come back to actually Ooh. producing their own steroids again, which is why it's worth the effort. And I would say you then have to very gently reduce the steroid supplement that they're having because you need to at, the, at one time that is going to suppress the body will say oh i've yeah. got enough of that hormone i don't yeah. need more of it so therefore there's a balance and a very gradual reduction but think of it this way it is an autoimmune disease there is actually a genetic test as predisposition for this as well especially in um, poodles um, so there is a predisposition i think that was also being looked at a great friend of mine um was looking at the genetic testing in uh, bearded collies um and uh, colleen i'll give you a shout out now because you're probably listening to this tomorrow because she always listens the day after um and uh she she was she got a whole group together because it was quite um a prominent issue within uh bearded collies at a time 
So can I swerve on that on this little bit here because you just mentioned something. So with the etiogenic uh, Addison's, which is caused where the person has caused it by by, by administering too much steroids and no, that's it, Cushing's. That's Cushing's. Sorry, Cushing's. Sorry, too much in Cushing's. Go to Cushing's. Pardon me, hence the non-vet here. Um, <laughs> is that sounds a bit like kind of insulin resistance? It sounds like too much of this is coursing through the blood, and it comes to the point that the organ uh, is it then is just switched into a hot like is asked to produce more and more. How does that? And I saw somebody had a confusion over that. No. Giving the steroid doesn't cause the body to excrete too much. For iatrogenic Cushing's, the solution is to withdraw the steroids yeah, and okay. the body should recover. It okay. is literally slowly, artificial. Slowly. Yeah, the artificial slowly. steroid is what's causing iatrogenic Cushing's. Okay. So it's literally the drug that we're putting in the front end is actually causing okay. all okay. of those symptoms of excess. Okay. So it sounds like you can improve it very quickly by steps you can take. So that's stress. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just going to take you through that very briefly. So yeah. you've got a normal dog in front of you. Okay. So this is a three-year-old spring spaniel in perfect condition. And you, because you're not a very nice person, want to do an experiment to create Cushing's disease. All you do is you give an excess of cortisol, of, of, of nisolone, say, which is, which is cortisone. Okay. So you give maybe... 20, 30 milligrams of, pre of, of, of prednisolone, which is the common one, the little white tablets that you get, five milligram. Uh, you just give it and give it and give it. And within a day or two, the dog is going to be drinking more and have an increased appetite. Within a week or two, you may induce a, a slight um, uh, pot belly. Okay. Within months and months, you might induce the uh, alopecia on, on the back. Um, and after a year or two of that, if the dog still survives, then you might be into calcineosis cutis kind of territory. And the treatment for this otherwise healthy dog is that you just gradually reduce it. And the reason that you reduce it slowly is because the body becomes dependent on that level. Yeah. So if you withdraw it, there's no safety net. So what you've got to do, even though it's, this is causing the problem, you would remember this is a mind experiment. Nobody in their right mind would give a normal dog steroid. OK, but we've induced iatrogenic Cushing's disease. And to cure that dog of this man made disease, you just gradually reduce the cortisol. And then once you're back down to normal, the dog, if there's no side effects, is back to normal. Okay. And what about for the other types of cushions, uh, Nick? So uh, th that's it. That's essentially what, so that's, that's, that's. Uh, the etrogenic okay. so, so naturally, naturally produced cushions. Okay. So you, no. your dog, you go, you go to the vet and they say your dog has cushions. It's, it's, it's important to the vet, whether it's a pituitary or it's adrenal Cushing's but to you it's it, it's the same okay what you do is they will offer you the conventional treatment is called veteril veteril I'm not sure what it's called in the states i suspect I it, it might up be on the, the same there yeah vet v-e-t-o-r-y-l and and what that does it just stops your adrenals producing cortisol does it cure the disease no it doesn't does it cure the symptoms and the the way the body is producing the symptoms yes it does if you stop using Veteril, does your disease just come back willy-nilly? Yes, it does. But it does what it says on the tin. However, there are side effects. And I've got a little list of side effects. And if you if you go on to Veteril and you don't see these side effects and the dog is absolutely great, well, thank you, lucky stars. That's fantastic. You can stick on that for as long as your vet is happy that your dog is on the Veteril. But if th th there, there are some side effects that you want to just look out for don't kind of invite them by thinking oh my god are they doing this are we doing that but just be aware to uh, to 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 look out for the following he says uh okay so um going off food lethargy depression vomiting diarrhea increased liver enzymes increased potassium uh, la 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 um yeah, blood parameters can change um, if you give too much veteril, yeah, because you've got increased cortisol, you can go into a not enough cortisol because you're giving too much of the, the drug and thus you can develop Addison's by giving this drug. Yeah. In the opposite way. 
Yeah. The body is producing too much cortisol. If you give the right level of veteril, you bring it back to the normal level of cortisol. If you give a little bit too much veteril, you go to too little cortisol in the blood and you become man-made Addison's. Okay. Wow. And you start collapsing and slow heart rate and all that stuff. Um, uh, shaking renal insufficiency. So if your dog has liver disease or kidney disease, you want to be really careful and you want to have a really good chat with your, with your vet about using Veteril and uh, look for the side effects of Veteril. I don't want to tell um, tales out of school, but they can be quite severe. Okay. So um, if I just go through treatment for um, Cushing's just no, now, for, yeah, this is, yeah. this is if the yeah, Veteril yeah. doesn't work or you choose not to do Veteril, there's a couple of treatments. I've got some examples here and then Brent can talk about treatment for, Addison's in a sec. So you would the baseline would be a fantastic raw food diet, the best antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, nutraceuticals, plenty of really good quality, well cared for fish oils, uh, um, and um, vitamin E and selenium and what have you. Okay, so you're just thinking anti anti inflammatory antioxidant just to calm and those are, are are valid for any dog whether it's got yeah, addison's really. or cushing's or anything yeah yeah we live in an inflammatory environment so doing those is a great idea but once you've done all the basics you've done the food and the nutraceuticals and everything and that's all hunky-dory what can you do on top what specific things can you do for for cushing's disease now one is that i will use as a base to my Many of my herbal supports I'll give liver support and, and 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 what have you, but Vitex Agnus Castus is a is the chaste tree because I guess used to give it to people to calm them down and not have libidinous thoughts and all that kind of stuff. Ooh. Look at look at if you don't know what that means. Look at I'm just trying to be. What happens when you go to Monaco? Yeah, yeah, (laughs) you have those thoughts. (laughs) How do you know? Uh, So, so, so uh, herbs. So the the the, the take home message, guys. Let's keep it simple. The take home message: herbs can be very useful when you're when you're dealing with too much cortisone because your adrenals are producing too much cortisone. Herbs are wonderful for these things, possibly even more so. And the the way I cut my teeth on homeopathics, I'm going to talk to you about homeopathics in a minute, is even from my very first days in in practice, we were treating ponies with Cushing's disease because back in the day, there was a bit of Cushing's disease in ponies and you could see it because they didn't lose their coats and they got a pot pot belly and they got fat pads above their eyes and all these things that that horses do that dogs may not do and so we we were we were talking we were were treating so we've been treating I've been treating we I I used to work with an amazing homeopath called Mark Elliott and he came up through witchcraft he came up with a mix of homeopathics I'm not sure if you can read that no, you probably no, can't. No. So can't it's, can't. Okay, A-C-T-H, so it's ACTH, ATTH, Quercus robor, which is yeah. oak. Yeah. So ACTH in potency, Quercus robor, which is oak in potency, and uranium nitricum, which is the stuff they make nuclear bombs, bombs out of, which is quite interesting because if you are exposed to radiation, you can get cancers, which cancers like pituitary cancers, which can give you Cushing's disease. So he's come up with that mix and I find it's really, really useful. I've got several dogs who can't take Veteril, who we keep in great control using uh, um, Vitex Agnes Castus and a few liver and general body support remedies and also we use the these rem this is this is a 200 c this is a 30 c potency and very simply with those we can get good good uh, good control bren you, you were going to say yeah i mean certainly for the cushings i've generally 
not gone for the nuclear option uh, purely and simply it scares the bejesus out of most people so i usually just use ATCH cortisol and the quercus rubor mix which um was in one of the original papers i think he sort of mixed it up a little bit but i don't think he dared to yeah. publish that last one in the vet record uranium I think knit he kept it yeah uranium <laughs> knit i think was um yeah might just have pushed some people over the edge um okay. but you're absolutely right i mean that this you know the pituitary axis as we call it has such a vital role in controlling not just your cortisol levels um, and what's going on with your adrenals but actually also what's happening in your thyroid what's happening with your sex hormones you know it has a vital role and the smallest i mean these can be a millimeter across and smaller you know and they have such a devastating effect on the rest of the body because of the impact of the hormones uh, and how they act so um be aware you know some people talk about radiotherapy for those pituitary um uh, gland tumors um, where they'll actually just focus an uh, uh, radiation beam to blast the pituitary uh, to bits effectively um uh, that always scares the bejesus out of me um so when people start talking about that but that's you know where they uh, will look at uh, highlighting those sort of treatments to try and cure those cases. Um, I always look at it as, look, this is treating a tumor. So I look at the plussing protocols. Um, I do use Mark Elliott's um, protocol. There are some great Chinese herb um, protocols, which will also bring in some of the mushrooms, which are anti-cancer into uh, those supporting the liver. Okay. Your alt yeah. will go through the roof. The ALT will go through the roof. Um, but that's not because of the tumor being in the liver or anything like that. That is literally the hormonal effects and the inflammation that starts to develop in the liver. So you need to sort of control that and monitor, you know, whether liver function is truly being interfered with or whether we just have hepatomegaly. That's an increase in liver size because of the effects of those steroids. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have um, I have a little bit here on uh, adrenal gland. Can I just read out a couple of paragraphs here, guys? Do I have it? So this is Addison's. A couple of little tips for Addison. Someone's already mentioned it for Cushing's uh, CBD for both issues. Uh, so CBD is shown to reduce cortisol, uh, anxiety, and stress, and all that kind of stuff. And I've heard nothing but good for uh, but good for CBD in both conditions. Google it at your leisure. But CBD keeps coming up on the side, so it's well worth a mention. Um, but Google at your leisure. Another one here, uh, which uh, if Caroline Ingram was listening, which I doubt she is, but if she is, she will be screaming licorice, uh, which is uh, glycerizic acid. Am I saying that? Glycerizic acid? Glycerizic acid yeah. is the active component in licorice. And licorice is anti-inflammatory, anti-allergy, anti-ulcer, uh, anti-estrogen uh, balancing properties, all sorts of cool stuff. But it's been used for years uh, for Addison's disease. Um, there's a great piece here. It suggests that uh, glycerizic acid increases the half-life of circulating cortisol in the body by inhibiting its metabolism or breakdown. So if you've got Addison's and you've got a very low amount of this stuff, this helps it uh, regulate, self-regulate a little bit. So licorice seems like a good thing. But glandular extract, right? Coming back to organotherapy, this is the feeding like feeds like. So, you know, if you're in if you're in Addison's mode and you've got a low production of these things, you might hope that if you fed the extract of the gland, you might kind of harvest some of the hormones that are in there to your benefit. And that's definitely the case. I mean, if you feed beef thyroid to a dog, he is going to suffer from the hormones that are in that thyroid as what happened in the US about 20 years ago. So, yes, you want to be careful with that. But in small, normal dose, as with everything, there may be benefits. And organotherapy we know it works we know from studies in the uh, 20s 30s and 40s they were mad about organotherapy to the point that they were trying to investigate like you know um they were taking semen from bulls and injecting it into men trying to make them stronger and all sorts of stuff loads of famous actors had it done loads of people died and uh, so that didn't go too well but they also started looking at pancreases to find out what was going on with the uh, insulin resistance and they were doing these support these horrible studies on dogs but they found out that actually feeding a dog pancreas had a better effect on their long-term uh, prognosis uh, along on their long-term kind of on their longevity 
So they took the pancreas away from these dogs, fed them high sugar diets, and to one they fed insulin, and the other ones they fed raw pancreas, and the ones eating raw pancreas did better for longer. So they, this organotherapy started taking off, and in the 20s, Addison's disease was the focus. Adrenal cortex, uh, the gland from pigs, sheep, cows, uh, was a big focus in the 20s. So during the early 1920s, adrenal cortex extract was often recommended for use uh, for patients with Addison's disease, human. Uh, uh, so in the 1940s is when it really took off. So adrenal cortex extract was used by doctors to combat symptoms associated with what was then commonly referred to as hypoadrenal syndrome. So it's low adrenal syndrome uh, and also uh, low blood sugar. Amongst the symptoms, adrenal cortex extract was touted as addressing uh, issues including insomnia, concentration issues, faintness, lightheadedness, fatigue, nervousness, depression, amongst many others. Um, in 1932, they found it balanced blood sugar, and they found that, that was a way of testing how good your adrenal cortex supplement was. So they would feed it, and they would check the blood sugars, and if they went up or down, whichever way it's supposed to be, that's how you measure how good your your gland your thing was. Um, so the problem is that modern science doesn't like adrenal gland uh, cortex because you know it's just a simple bit of meat that you would feed, and they need double blind RCTs to to promote a product, you know, these days. And so I find there's a bit of a kickback, certainly in the literature. If you go to any of the Google kind of uh, related to websites like Healthline and whatnot, they will say, well, there's not enough evidence. There's never enough evidence for the non-patented stuff. Uh, but there, there is some little bits and pieces out there to suggest that it has been useful, uh, certainly in the past. But the problem was that they started producing synthetic extracts from the gland, and those don't work as well as feeding the actual gland itself, like feeding insulin, as I mentioned in the pancreatic dogs to feeding raw pancreas. So actually feeding the gland itself in dry tablet form, which you can buy online, there may be something to it. Uh, so the question will be, and I said I was going to ask this at the start, but the question will be, um, they describe how you can pre prepare it yourself, but you guys are just going to buy your own adrenal glands where you're not going to be harvesting adrenal glands from the local pigs. But um, so uh, th th there was many case studies have been published on this. So it's not without evidence because these days they don't want to talk about case studies, but case studies were a really important part of science because they didn't have a hundred people to work on. They had two or three patients in their clinic and they tried this and certainly add in adrenal gland 20 to 30 capsules of dried adrenal gland to some of these addison's uh, patients saw complete turnarounds got this uh, two of them in australia got these electricians back on their feet and back to work and uh, so there was success to that the question is lads is there any harm in trying dried uh, adrenal gland extract i mean if you were to feed whole prey to the dog whole fish whole baby birds i mean the dog is a whole prey eater they would always get some thyroid and adrenal gland in moderate normal dose is there any harm in trying a little bit of adrenal gland extract in addison dogs i'm not sure whether you can get it in the uk in the us you can oh. because they are crazy about organ uh, 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 organotherapy okay so, ah. so so yes go for it in 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 the united states i would always suggest though these are these are serious diseases these are potentially especially addison's is potentially life-threatening so I would suggest don't do it yourself. Make sure that you've got a vet who is 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 on board with what you're feeding, with nutraceuticals, any herbs and homeopathics that you're doing. Uh, you've had a chat about the pharmaceutical options, and you you know where you are. And I would suggest get stability before you start doing anything, and uh, definitely before you start using any uh organic uh organotherapy and in the uk i don't think you can get hold of it so i think that's a bit of a slam yeah, dunk it's not looking you good can't here. do it no yeah. no and don't forget you know somebody was mm. asking well what's epi and you know that's another immune mediated disease where you've got an attack on the release of um the enzymes from the pancreas you know exocrine pancreatic insufficiency you know you can get so it's a little bit of a flag. If you've got other autoimmune diseases, keep an eye out for this. Now, often things like Addison's as part of that immune system complex is masked because so many of those cases will have steroids given to them. Um, so it is something that, as I'm saying, talking about treating it as an immune mediated disease and trying to do all of the things that we would do to control that. Yes, that should also help all of these other issues with immune mediated disease to keep an eye out on. Okay. Okay, good. gents, I'm going to say, uh, make sure that you catch up with us on your podcast. 
whichever your podcast provider is because we're there please do follow us on patreon if you can we'd be really 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 grateful and i think now we should pop over to patreon to just finish our chat on cushing's and addison's disease what do you think boys sounds good ready to go brilliant cool. that was great, great to that see you great. all brilliant that was great. Thank you. Learned so much cheers lads we're going to nip over now and it's ready for you to listen to in about an hour or so so in the U- uk that will be after about 9 9 30 tonight okay guys thanks a lot